In this codex review, we will be covering the Tau Empire. Before we get into reviewing any units, I'd like to go over the main mechanics of Tau as it should help you understand why I'm rating things where they are. Firstly, we'll start with Markalites. Markalites are a heavy weapon that give friendly Tau extra bonuses against a target that has Markalites applied to them. To grossly oversimplify, they improve the Tau's chance to hit. The most significant of all the Markalite levels is of course 5, as it is the maximum level and it gives all Tau units targeting that unit plus 1 to hit. To apply a Markalite to a unit, a model equipped with a Markalite needs to hit the target unit with the Markalite weapon. The second mechanic to talk about is drones. Drones are models that are often included inside of other units in order to give them bonuses. However, the drones behave like their own unit once deployed. You can get certain drones in their own squad if you don't want to deploy them near any unit. I will discuss each drone when I get to their section in the review. The only rule that goes across all drones is the ability to intercept wounds in a similar manner to most bodyguard rules, except it applies to all infantry and battle suits rather than just characters. Another mechanic the Tau have is for the greater good, which allows units within 6 inches of a unit that is already being charge to fire overwatch at the unit that is charging. The only downside to this really good ability is that you can't fire overwatch again even if you are the target of a charge. Something I really should have been doing from the start is going over the good sub-factions. The Tau have quite a large variety of sub-factions between their standard lot and the ability to make custom sets. The strongest pre-made sets are almost certainly the Tau set because of the 5-up overwatch which works well with for the greater good, and Velora set which ignores the penalty for advancing and firing assault weapons and also turns any rapid fire weapons into assault weapons after advancing. Alternatively, you can make your own set with two of the traits from the Psychic Awakening book. The best ones, in my opinion, are Gifted Pilots for the wound rerolls for vehicles and monsters, Hardened Warheads for the AP on your missiles, Stabilization Systems for the extra mobility on your battle suits, and finally Upgunned for the extra AP on your burst cannons. Finally, as tournaments have been quiet lately due to ongoing events, I'm going to tentatively say that Farsight Enclaves might be an up and coming army for Tau, thanks to being able to take one more commander per detachment and having two faction traits as well. Right, before we continue, let's go over the star rate. Things. A 1 star unit is pretty bad and probably a detriment to your army. 2 star unit is playable in a casual scenario, although not necessarily the best option or requires a lot of support to work. 3 star unit is good in casual play, it might see some good results in tournaments as well. A 4 star unit occasionally is seen in top 3 lists but is often a tech choice or personal preference. And finally a 5 star unit consistently turns up in top 3 lists. So let's get started with 1 star. For the first unit in 1 star we start with Unvar. Unvar is a more expensive ethereal. The Ethereals carry a selection of auras they can activate to buff nearby Tau units, but I'll go into more detail about the buffs when I get into the Ethereals themselves. But for now, we'll go into more detail about what makes Unvar different. Firstly, you have a unit of bodyguards that goes with Unvar. They're okay melee combatants, though you don't want to be charging them into melee as that puts Unvar at great risk. You can pass your first 4 wounds off to the bodyguards as well, which brings Unvar up to an effective 10 wounds. Unvar also has the unique effect that allows you to re-roll morale tests for any Tau units whilst Unvar is on the battlefield. This would be pretty good if Ethereals also didn't give nearby Tau units leadership 9, which makes it really hard for them to run away anyway. The final unique thing about Unvar is their Paradox of Duality effect, which turns all negative AP targeted at this unit into an increased save. My only problem with this is that Unvar only has a 5 up save and is toughness 3, so you can basically shoot any of your infantry fire into them and it'll probably get through. In the end, you have a bunch of effects that don't really impact the game enough to pay the additional 35 points for. Next up in 1 star, we have the TY7 Devilfish. The Devilfish is a pretty standard transport. It and its drones carry some light weaponry for fighting off infantry, and it has a transport capacity to cart your infantry around. Problem is, I don't really see what infantry you're going to be carrying around. You could bring breacher teams close to the front line, but I think you're better off either using breacher teams to wait for your opponent to come to you, or bringing enough numbers and advancing up the board. By taking the Devilfish, you're basically losing a full squad of fire warriors. For a bit of safety on the unit, you're taking up the board. Not to mention that at toughness 7 and with only a 3 up save, most anti tank weapons are going to go through this thing, and once it's dropped to a second bracket, it's already moving at the same speed as the unit of fire warriors. Before I continue, there is something unique about a lot of tower vehicles. They have the ability to take drones as part of the vehicle, which usually improves the ballistic skill of the drone and stops them from being picked off. You can usually replace them with some smart missiles, and if you're taking tower vehicles, that is usually the recommended setup, but the mechanic is definitely worth mentioning. Furthermore, tower vehicles don't get for the greater good, which is something to consider when building your army. Next up in one star is Crute Hounds. They're an incredibly cheap fast attack option, so if you're building a brigade for some reason and don't want to use the amazing tactical drones, you can take these. Their stats across the board are pretty unimpressive, lacking good saves, decent leadership, or a good toughness. The good things about them are their high speed, which just means they end up charging into your opponents to die faster, and their melee actually carries AP. If they got an extra strength on the charge, they'd probably be at least decent at chewing on guardsmen. They do have a stratagem that allows other Crute to reroll their charges if they are within 12 inches of the Crute Hounds, 
so you can use them like scouting units to get in and allow the rest of your crew to follow up. But even then, crew melee doesn't really impress me all too much to make these guys worth it. I'll mention now that none of the crew benefit from any of the sept effects which also hurts their playability quite a bit. Next up in one star is the TX4 Piranhas. Piranhas suffer quite badly in this edition like a lot of other biker units, being at the point where they're expensive enough to be focused and also being vulnerable to anti-infantry and anti-tank weapons. It means they won't last too long on the board. A 4-up save just isn't enough sadly. These guys do have the attached drone mechanic which gives them a couple of extra guns which is okay for picking up infantry on the way up the board. Unfortunately you can't swap these out for smart missiles so you're stuck with the short range pulse carbine. Next up in one star is the Tidewall Gunrig. Unlike a lot of fortifications, these guys can actually move. All you have to do is stick some infantry in there. The infantry can still shoot out of it as it has the open topped rule. This thing also carries a gun of its own which has absolutely beastly stats. One slight problem, the building has a 5 up ballistic skill. So the only time this thing is going to hit anything is either with quite a bit of luck or waiting until you get 5 marker lights on something. Not only that, but you can't choose what it's going to shoot at unless it has a squad squatting inside of it. Because the only infantry that aren't battle suits are characters, fire warriors and pathfinders, whatever you put inside isn't going to be able to match the range of the gun rig and therefore will just be sat inside this thing the whole game. To top it all off, this thing is 120 points and still only has a 4 up save. And finally in one star we have the tide wall shield line. The shield line suffers from the same issues as the gun reg, except this thing doesn't carry a big point intensive gun. I should mention that you can't advance or charge with any of these things, so the 6 inch movement is all you're getting. What makes the shield line special? Well, it has the ability to do a mortal wound to whomever targets it on an unmodified save roll of 6. As it is an unmodified roll, there is no reason not to roll for the save, even if it has been hit by an AP-3 or more weapon. These bouncing shots do come at the cost of one toughness compared to the other fortifications though. Another thing that makes the shield line unique amongst other tower fortifications is that it can take another 70 point fortification, the Tidewall Defense Platform. The Defense Platform has no notable abilities, except the Defense Platform can explode and the Shield Line cannot. Moving on now into two stars, we start with Crute Shapers. If you're bringing a ton of Crute, the rerolls of ones to wound will beef them up a little bit. At only 20 points, this guy is one of the cheapest elite slot fillers, so if you're trying to build a brigade and you haven't put your three Riptides in your list, you can bring some of these guys. The last noteworthy thing about this guy is his leadership aura, which is two leadership points worse than ethereal, so just take one of them. The extra points are worth it. Next up in two stars is Krutox Riders. They are appropriately costed, but Krut's support isn't fantastic. The gun they carry is decent all around, light vehicle, tough infantry slayer, and between marker lights and their 4 ballistic skill they're hitting somewhat reliably, plus the long range on their gun means that they can get into rapid fire range a lot quicker. The melee is okay, although if you want some damage you'll probably have to drop the stratagem on them that increases their number of attacks and gives them some decent AP. The big thing that kills this unit is a 6 up save, which all Krut seem to share, really makes them vulnerable to being destroyed by basically anything. Next up is the AX3 Razor Shark Strike Fighter. The Razor Shark is a plane that capitalizes on you controlling the air. The Quad Iron Turret is really nice for this as it adds one to your ballistic skill when it is shooting at things that can't fly. Really, I feel like this should read the Flyer Battlefield role instead of Fly Keyword, but whatever. Aside from that, they carry some minor armament and a couple of Seeker missiles. Problem is there's a lot better things you can get for around 100 points, especially in Tau. This thing really doesn't hinder your army too much when taking it, but its stat line is unimpressive and the weapons don't do enough damage to either infantry or tanks. If it could take support equipment to beef up some of its profile, it would probably be a lot better, but that goes for pretty much all of the tower vehicles. It is still a flyer which makes it annoying to kill, so at least your 100 point investment isn't likely to be destroyed unless your enemy is teching against your army. Next up in two stars is the 8. I'll absolutely take being wrong on this one, it's really hard to evaluate 8 models with 8 different sets of weapons and abilities, especially as they come bundled in 1 points cost. I really can't pick apart any particular one and say it's weak when some of the others might make up for it by being really points efficient. All in all, these guys are fluffy and fun. Just remember that you're losing a ton of flexibility with your army when you're putting over half of your army into one unit which you can't use the war gear off. Finally in two stars, we have the Tidewall Drone Port. This building comes with up to 4 drones. There's no point to take this over the shield line without taking the drones, so what can the drones actually do? They either add a tiny amount of firepower, dish out some marker lights, or have a good invuln save. If you're taking the drone port, you should probably take the ones with some guns, but even then the cost is highly prohibitive sitting at 110 points if you're taking all 4 drones. So why is this in 2 stars and not 1 stars you may ask? Well it's pretty stupid but you can throw a cadre fireblade inside the drone port which in turn allows the drones to detach and as long as that cadre fireblade sits inside there and is kept safe you'll have 4 drones with a ballistic skill of 2 up. 
considering how mediocre the gun drone is, this is probably best used on the marker drone to have a fast moving 2 up marker light. At the end of this setup you'll have a paid 150 points for some pretty reliable marker lights which ultimately isn't worth it. Your Cadre Fireblade will also be kept pretty safe so if you make him the Warlord he'll be much less likely to be picked off, however there are no Warlord traits that support this stupid style of play. Moving on into 3 stars, we start with Commander Farsight. Commander Farsight is the best melee unit in the Tau, there's not really much of an argument there. With a great strength 8, minus 4, AP and D3 damage on his 4 attacks, he's probably going to either kill or severely wound whatever you're hitting into, assuming it doesn't have a ridiculously high invulnerable save. He also carries a nice anti-elite infantry gun, and while it does have a limited number of shots, it'll probably kill whatever he points it at. This so his combat capabilities are pretty good, so now we look into his aura effect which allows rerolls of ones for melee and ones for shooting against orcs. The specific anti-orc effect is pretty minor, especially compared to Yarrick's effect against orcs, because Tau have some really easy ways of getting rerolls of one in the shooting phase. The melee rerolls aren't too useful either, because Tau don't really have a ton of melee options. They have croup, but they don't get affected by the aura, as they aren't farsight enclaves. They have the eight, quite a few of the HQs and elite characters have weapons and skills that are quite high, but none of them carry melee weapons that are that great. And finally, there's a relic you can take on commanders to replace the fusion blaster, but there's very limited use for this aura. I think if it gave plus one to hit in the fight phase, I think a few more Tau units would want to charge in. Commander Farsight can declare a second Montcar, which really helps with your army's mobility, and considering all the faction traits for Farsight benefit from being in close range, it'll help you maximise the benefits for that. To round him off, he has Deep Strike, and is reasonably tanky with a good invuln save. What else Farsight from competitive lists is the limit on commanders, and melee Tau not being really a viable thing. Even with Farsight Enclaves being able to take more commanders, Farsight still isn't good enough to be chosen over the regular ones. Next up in 3 stars is Dark Strider. Dark Strider is a unique HQ and seems to be primarily used for its structural analyzer ability. This ability allows a nearby infantry squad to improve their wound rolls by one against a target unit. This comes in handy with one of the best warlord traits with unity devastation. Unfortunately, Dark Strider doesn't get this ability himself but you can always bring a character with this warlord trait to get the stacking bonus. Downside is Tau don't have a ton of infantry to capitalise on this, the most notable is probably stealth suits which won't usually be in range of Darkstrider. He's not a bad pickup, but Tau have better or cheaper options in the HQ slot. Next up in 3 stars is Long Strike. You like your hammerheads? This guy will help them out quite a bit, gives them an extra to hit, but they do have to stick together. Hammerheads reach their maximum ballistic skill when they've got 5 marker lights on the target they're shooting at, but this guy will help if they are bracketed. Not only does he boost the effectiveness of hammerheads, he's also nasty in the shooting phase himself as he gets plus 1 to wound against monsters and vehicles. One interesting thing is that as a Tau hammerhead, he gets affected by his own aura, and therefore can move and not suffer the penalties to hit due to having plus 1 to hit to cancel it out. He's only 37 points more more than a normal hammerhead, so if you're bringing a handful of them and are playing Tau Sept, you might as well bring them. Do note that bringing him does restrict your hammerheads to being in Tau Sept in order to gain his benefits, and you'd really like to go with those AP-1 missiles from the custom set, so bear it in mind when building your lists. Next up in 3 stars is XV-8 Crisis Battle Suits. They're quite good. I think of them like elite infantry with some good infantry busting capabilities. I personally wouldn't rely on them for their anti-tanks due to the low volume of shots from the fusion blaster, which is the only proper anti-tank weapon they could take, and only having a 4 up ballistic skill hurts that. I'd recommend bringing a couple of burst cannons with the advanced targeting system to give them some good medium strength low AP anti-infantry weapons. Big problem is this puts them at 46 points per model which is pretty taxing. You could take them at their minimum 30 points per model with just a single flamer but then they're not too useful. For some reason these guys get a sergeant equivalent for 3 extra points for 1 more leadership and 1 more attack, neither of which are all too useful in Tau. Next up in 3 stars is the XV-8 Crisis Bodyguards. Really quickly, same as the Crisis Battle Suits, but you pay 3 points for the Bodyguard Wall and 1 more leadership on every member of the squad. Not the worst option, but worse than the regular suits. Next in 3 stars is the XV-95 Ghost Keel Battle Suits. The Ghost Keel is a big stealthy battle suit, as much sense as that makes. It comes with some stealth drones, which give themselves a nearby Ghost Keel's minus 1 to hit. This is nice for the Ghost Keel because it stacks with the existing minus 1 to hit on the Ghost Keel. If you can keep the stealth drones hidden, they can almost permanently give the Ghost Keel minus 2 to hit, which is incredibly annoying for a lot of armies. Unfortunately, I'm not a huge fan of the rest of the chassis. 10 wounds is the minimum required to be a bracketable unit. 
it also gets bracketed very easily, only requiring it to lose 5 wounds. Add to that, only toughness 6 and you'll probably find yourself getting bracketed reasonably easily. Out of its weapon options, I'd go for the Cyclic Iron Raker for a bit of plasma-like damage and the Burst Cannons for some anti-infantry weaponry. Then take the Advanced Targeting System and either the Shield Generator or the Velocity Tracker, depending on what you're fighting. This does bring it to either 166 points with a Shield Generator or 146 points with a Velocity Tracker, which is quite a high points cost to pay, but minus 2 to hit and 4 up in Vaughn save will preserve those points reasonably well. Next up in 3 stars is the Vespid Stingwings. They've got deep strike and good weapons to make use out of it. Strength 5 minus 2 AP is really good for dealing with most infantry. Their really high mobility allows them to follow up their deep strike to keep chasing down infantry. Their toughness 4 and 4 up save are okay at keeping them alive, but not enough considering their 11 points. The big thing that makes the Vespid relatively weak in the Tau is that there are plenty of ways of getting strength 5 from a safer range. Admittedly, most of the time you're sacrificing AP to do this, but those units also get the benefits of Sept traits and for the greater good. Next up in 3 stars is the AX-39 Sun Shark Bomber. This thing shares the same stat line as the Razor Shark, but is much more playable. Firstly, it carries a Mark Light, which helps you lay down Mark Lights on hard to reach targets. Note, you will be limited to a 5-up Ballistic skill until you get the 4th level of Mark Light, so bear that in mind. They can carry up to 2 Missile Pods, which is nice for laying down some anti-elite infantry or anti-light vehicle firepower. They also carry 2 Interceptor Drones, which you can attach, although I'd probably keep them on the Sun Shark, because they benefit from the Sun Shark's higher Ballistic skill. The final thing to note is that the Sun Shark can bomb things. If it flies over a unit in the movement phase, it can drop a bomb. The bomb hits a single squad, and for every model in the squad, it has a chance to deal a mortal wound. This bomb does max out at 10 models, and is only a 5 up unless you're hitting infantry. Getting some mortal wounds out is always welcome, and a good way of busting some high invuln saves. Typically high invuln saves come with high number of wounds and in low squads, which kinda sucks, but some damage through is better than getting no damage at all. At the end of the day, flies are always a pain to kill due to minuses to hit and high mobility, so it's 150-ish points isn't completely unreasonable. Next up in 3 stars is the MV-71 Sniper Drones. They are bog standard snipers with the only exception being their 5 up ballistic skill. You can compensate for this with Firesight Marksmen which boosts their ballistic skill to a 4 up, and if you can stick the drone controller support system nearby them, they get to a nice 3 up ballistic skill, which is somewhat consistent for picking off characters. I wouldn't consider mark lights too much, considering the fact it's quite hard to get mark lights on characters if they're screened properly, so 3 up ballistic skill is probably the best you're getting. Maybe I've been spoiled by guards cheap rattlings, but 16 points is quite an investment for snipers that need more support to be good. At least the sniper drones are somewhat resilient with minus 1 to hit, and an okay save and toughness. In the end, these guys are the only snipers in the Tau Codex, and being able to disrupt your opponents by picking off characters is always something you should consider. Next up in 3 stars is the TX-7 Hammerhead Gunship. It's a solid anti-vehicle option with good range. It has fly, good movement, which allows it to navigate terrain easily, and put it in a place where you want it to sit. Its 3-up ballistic skill allows it to shoot better than an average tower unit, and it carries some big weapons that capitalise on that good ballistic skill. Like a lot of tanks, it can't move and fire heavy weapons without the penalty. However, at the 4th level of marker lights, that downside is negated. It is a lot to expect 4 levels of marker lights on the units you want to aim your hammerhead at, so you might have to accept a turn or two of bad shooting until you can get into position and or you have the time to apply the marker lights. The biggest downsides are no invuln save, so if this thing gets hit by some proper anti-tank, it'll probably die quite easily, and a lack of for the greater good, so it doesn't get to help any other units being charged. The cost is also quite prohibitive, and the anti-tank roll can be fulfilled by some other units that do it on a cheaper chassis and kill more consistently. Next up in 3 stars is the TX-78 Skyray Gunship. It has two mark lights, which is good for dumping them quickly down on a target, and as this thing has a 3-up ballistic skill, it is more likely to get them down. It comes with a velocity tracker, so it can hit flying things more consistently. Basically, if you're finding your marker drones and fire warriors too inconsistent to hitting their marker lights due to a lower ballistic skill or a bad case of the dying, or if you're unable to put down any marker lights on things with fly, then these guys should be what you go to. They do end up being an expensive chassis for doing this though. The Skyray does come with a bit more equipment. It has gun drones, which it can swap out for some smart missiles or or burst cannons. Oh, and of course, it carries six seeker missiles. I really haven't talked about these things properly. So, seeker missiles are long range, high strength, fiddling AP, D6 damage weapons. Exactly like hunter killer missiles if you play guard. Sounds good for five points, even if you can only shoot them once per game. Problem is, they only hit on sixes. This would cripple them to the point of uselessness. However, there's one thing that fixes that. At level two mark lights, these guys start hitting at the unit's ballistic skill. Second level of mark lights isn't too hard to accomplish, and considering the Skyray can get to the second level 
level by itself, and has a handful of Seeker missiles with a good ballistic skill, it should be able to capitalize on this quite well. You actually can fire all six of those Seeker missiles at once too, as they are all their own weapon, so if you need a large amount of burst damage then this can do that reasonably well. Yeah I like it, but I'm never a fan of Toughness 7 and no invuln save, though I think this thing is around the points cost where you're not too upset if it dies, plus its damage is mostly front loaded which is always good. Finally in 3 stars we have the KV-128 Storm Surge. At 277 points as a starting cost, this is quite cheap for a Lord of War. You also get a decent selection of weapons and can take up to 3 different support systems, which improves the Storm Surge ability to kill and not be killed. I'd run this thing as a long range fire support unit, giving it a pulse driver cannon for the extra range. Throw on the shield generator and the advanced targeting system to improve it across the board and for the third equipment slot you should choose between the early warning override or velocity tracker depending on your personal preference. It does suffer from having only a 4 up ballistic skill but at least it can move without suffering any penalties and marker lights help it out further. You can also improve its ballistic skill by using its anchors ability at the end of the shooting phase which allows it to sit still and get a plus one to hit at the cost of not being able to fight, charge, pile in or move. You can always opt out of the anchors at the start of your movement phase so the commitment isn't that severe unless you really want your storm surge to be getting into fights. The problems with the storm surge for me are 1 toughness 7, 2 sitting still just means your opponent won't move models into line of sight and 3 you must wait a minimum of two turns before you can benefit from anchors. The biggest of these problems is the toughness 7. So much anti-vehicle stuff is strength 8 which means you're just going to be hemorrhaging wounds and people will be more than happy to focus via your big pretty towel suit. I do think with the points cuts received in chapter approved 2019 it might be a viable choice to bring three of them just for fun. Note that this does end up being about half your army in three models. Moving on now into four stars, we start with Commander Shadowsun. She's a pretty strong character across the board. A lot of her damage comes with her Melter-esque weapons and they'll be consistently hitting with her good ballistic skill. She can also guarantee she'll pretty much be in range turn 1 as she can deploy near the enemy deployment zone. The only other units that can do this are the stealth battle suits and ghost keels and seeing as her bodyguard rule only applies to stealth suits you might as well deploy them together aggressively. Declaring a second Kion is good for getting the extra consistency to hit and can help kill a unit or two more, even considering the limited range of the ability. The 24 inch range on a high energy fusion blaster means that Shadow Sun does have about the right amount of range to be able to sit still and get the benefits from Kion herself. My main problems that keep her out of 5 stars are her cost which is about 30 more than the base of the most expensive commander and her her abilities which aren't that impactful, enough to push her into every list at least. The rerolls to 1 aren't that useful when you can either get it through one marker light or through one of the ethereal buffs, and the rest of the abilities are mostly just to keep her alive for longer. That does make her a decent warlord for objective purposes which is something to bear in mind. Next up in 4 stars is the commander in the XV-8 Crisis Battlesuit. I don't want to go too in depth with the commanders just yet, but you should know that this unit is still really good. They're just ousted by the more popular and much stronger variants of the commander. It can also take a piece of armor that improves its save to a 2 up for 10 points which is worth it if you're taking Crisis Commanders unless you're going for a minimum point commander. Next up in 4 stars is Crook Carnivores, weird that Crook makes it this high, but they are better than quite a few other troops considering their price, just considering the stat line and weapons. They even get a vanguard deploy, but they lack the set traits and don't get the benefit of most of the stratagems. Though a 4 point bolter carrier is pretty scary, the tower infantry have access to a lot better weapons for not that much more cost. The 6 up save is pretty bad, and while people like to big them up as Tau's melee fighters, they've only got one attack at strength 4 with no AP, which isn't really going to kill too much. At the end of the day you're getting what you pay for which is a cheap troops choice. Good for holding objectives and okay in a gunfight. Shout out to the Daleth Warlord trait that gives the Kroot for the greater good. Next up in 4 stars is Firesight Marksman. They're pretty expensive for an infantry with only toughness 3 and a 4 up save, but being able to put mark lights on a 3 up ballistic skill model, which isn't a huge vehicle, is 100% worth it. Plus these guys can sit in the back line in cover to get a disgusting 2 up save. They do have some synergy with sniper drones, but the Firesight Marksman work fine independently of them, just try not to get them caught out or else they'll be splattered pretty quickly. Next up in 4 stars is XV-25 Stealth Battlesuits. The Stealth Battlesuits are great for getting and keeping early control of the board. They are a pain to kill with their 2 wounds and minus 1 to hit. They can stay mobile with their 8 inch movement and assault weapons. You can even throw a fusion blaster in the squad for some melt style tank busting. The big downside of them is of course their cost. They are 22 points each for just the basic stealth suit and if you want to be throwing in the Shazaf Ray for the leadership bonus and access to marker lights, you are adding an extra 6 points onto that squad as well. If I were to take these guys I would keep their costs 
costs as low as possible, and use them to wall off your opponent from contested objectives. They are a pain to kill, and if you can force your opponent to invest some more significant firepower into killing them, I think they've done their job. I'll also note that these guys are probably the best carriers of the drone control support system, as they are one of the cheapest squads you can take it on. Getting their plus to hit on marker drones and sniper drones could be quite useful. Next up in 4 stars is Dayak Grek. Unlike a lot of Blackstone Fortress models, this guy crops up in a large amount of competitive tower lists. He's a very cheap sniper with a deep strike and the ability to drop a mortal wound on a unit from anywhere on the map. This is pretty good at chipping away at a difficult to kill infantry unit, and his cost is pretty efficient for that. It does kind of suck when you roll a 1 for the damage, but even if you kill a tactical marine, you basically made his points back. It's not so great against hordes, the only improvement is it triggers on a 3 up instead of a 4 up, and you have a 1 in 6 chance to do d6 mortal wounds instead. It's nice, but it's not consistent. To round Dayak off, he gets plus 2 to his cover save, which to be fair he needs as he only has a 6 up save normally. Next up in 4 stars is the Pathfinder team. Pathfinder is a really good way of getting marker lights down quickly. As each member of the squad carries a marker light, you can use every member of the squad to put one down. Their vanguard move allows them to be in better position to fire the marker lights. Their fire up save is a little annoying because it means they can get blown off the board before you can get the marker lights down, however the long range of marker lights does keep you out of range of most threatening anti-infantry things. If you feel like you need to stay out of your opponent's firing range while going for kills with the Pathfinder team, you can give them a pulse accelerator drone which will increase their range. They also have the option of the Gravin inhibitor drone, which is okay for protecting against charges, but for the greater good should scare most opponents away from charging. I guess it's better if you're running these guys out on their own to try and get marker lights. Finally they have a recon drone, which isn't really worth it in my opinion. Ignoring cover isn't too important for these guys, as they mostly want to be dumping marker lights on everything, rather than trying to shoot things in cover. The final thing to know about Pathfinders is their slightly above average movement, which is good for getting them across the map and getting them into position to pop down their marker lights. And finally in 4 stars we have the XV-88 Broadside Battle Suits. They're good at doing a bit of anti-everything between their smart missile pods and rail rifles. If you aren't sure what you're going to fight and you've already run out of slots for Riptides, I'd recommend Broadsides. As mentioned, they carry a bit of anti-everything, but you can specialise them into killing elite infantry by giving them plasma rifles and high yield missile pods. The problem starts with their 4 up ballistic skill, which means you'll be needing to lay down a decent number of marker lights before these guys can punch hard. With high yield missile pods, you might not need it as badly due to the higher volume of shots, but the heavy keyword will probably mess with you as you try to get into position. Once again, this can be fixed through the application of marker lights on the unit you want deadified. The broadsides do carry a unique drone with a missile pod, but it isn't worth it. Just take tactical drones if you are taking drones with these guys. As for the stat line and cost, I think both are reasonable. The only thing I'd like to see would be a bit more movement. As for the support systems, you're probably expecting advanced targeting systems and shield generators. And you'd be right. You might want to split them between the squads so you have some with higher AP and some can tank shots with the shield generators. These guys can also be considered for the drone control as they can be taken in a squad of one unlike the stealth suits and have much longer range on their rail rifle and missile systems so they can sit with the marker drones to give them their better ballistic skill whilst actually helping with shooting rather than sitting around like a lemon. Finally, we move on to 5 stars with Unshi. For only 5 points more than a normal ethereal, you're getting a 4 up and vulnerable save, 1 more wound, 1 better weapon skill, and 2 more attacks. This character is an absolute steal for his effects. They make a decent option for your warlord due to his high and vulnerable save, and generally wanting to stay out of the line of fire. The only downsides I can really see are you can't get a hover drone for more mobility, and you don't get the 2 extra tactical drones, and you're also limited to Valorocept. The lack of the hover drone is probably the only real issue here though, as tactical drones can support him through the tactical drone own squad, and Valora is one of the better all-round Accept traits. The final thing to mention specifically about Unshi is that his 5 phase is actually pretty good. Hitting with a strength 5 weapon with 5 attacks and hitting on a 2 up is a really good way to deter people who think Tau are no good in melee. Additionally, you can give him minus 2 AP in any 5 phase, which is really great for killing off enemies that are a bit too close. If Unshi is caught in an unfavourable combat, you can ditch the minus 2 AP and instead take the rerolls to his invuln saves. You probably want to save his melee for heroic interventions though, rather than charging him off on his own. I will note that Unshi is very close to 4 stars due to the popularity of custom sets, but Unshi is in any competitive Valora list. Although what belongs in 4 stars and what belongs in 5 stars is up for me to interpret, before I made it so that only units that are consistently turning up in winning competitive lists would make it into 5 stars, however this puts named characters that are tied to a faction at a massive disadvantage. So starting from this review forward, named characters are going to get a little bit more consideration if they are consistently turning up in a less popular but still winning tournament list. Next up in 5 stars we have the Cadre Fireblade. They are a cheap HQ option that carries a mark light at a 2 up ballistic skill and also improves nearby units pulse rifles, carbines and pistols. Super simple stuff. You can also keep him protected with a couple of tactical drones just to keep pesky snipers away.
And now, in five stars, we have the Commander in the XV-85 Enforcer Battle Suit. Alright, now we can tuck into one of the best units in the game, let alone Tau. Let's start with the stat line. It is really good across the board, especially considering it's meant to be dropping to the front line. That's right, dropping. Every commander has access to Deep Strike, allowing it to get in range of its really good weapons. The weapons you choose are mostly up to you, but the most popular choice is definitely the Fusion Blaster. Take two of them and a couple of pieces of support equipment, and this thing will tear through anything that has the misfortune of getting in its way. As per usual, shield generators and advanced targeting systems are probably the way to go. The final thing to mention about the commander is the ability to call Montcar or Kayun at the start of the turn. These allow you to allow units nearby the commander to be a lot more mobile or dish out more firepower respectively, which are two things that I think every army would appreciate. Next up in 5 stars is the commander in the XV-86 Cold Star Battle Suit. The Cold Star has all the same benefits as the Enforcer, but for an extra 14 points on the chassis, you're getting 20 inches of movement and a 20 inch advance. This allows you to easily engage your next target after destroying your first. Out of the three commanders, I'm pretty sure this is the strongest one. The only other thing to note about this one in particular is the high output burst cannon it can carry, which gives you double the number of shots for double the number of points over a normal burst cannon. But it doesn't really matter seeing you should probably be taking the fusion blaster or the flamer if you're making it a cheap commander. Next up in 5 stars is Ethereals. Ethereals are great because they set the leadership of nearby units to 9, which means the normal leadership 7 the tower dealing with is improved significantly. Beyond that, he has the Invocation of the Elements ability, which is where most of his power comes in. There are 4 different abilities you can choose from in the movement phase to give buffs to nearby infantry and battle suits. The best of these abilities, in my opinion, are the Sense of Stone for a 6 up ignore wound, and Zephyr's Grace which allows you to re-roll the dice to advance. Storm of Fire is also pretty good if you can guarantee you won't be moving the nearby units, However, I think in 8th you need to stay more mobile unless you're using artillery. You can't just sit in your deployment zone and hope the opponent charges directly into you. Plus, you can just get the rerolls of 1 to hit from just landing a single mark light, which isn't too hard to do. Next up in 5 stars is the Breacher Teams. They're one of your options to take Fire Warriors. These guys carry shotgun-like weapons that get more powerful the closer you get to your target. The fact that they are Assault, and even at the maximum range the profile is decent, means that you can choose the engagement before you run in for the killing blow. For the Fire Warrior stat line, it's pretty good for 7 points. Toughness 3 and 4 up save are probably the things I dislike the most, but that comes to having a cheap unit. 4-up ballistic skill isn't too bad when you can get decent volume of fire out. Movement 6 is average, enough to get you around the board but they're not exactly zipping around. The sergeant or chassoui of the squad can take a mark light as well, so if you need some cheap mark lights then you can throw them in there too. Both the fire warrior squads have access to the guardian drone, which gives them a 6-up invulnerable save, which will help against any army that carries a lot of AP on their infantry shredding weapons. Although I think most of the time shield drones are a better option, as they are better for taking the wounds with savior protocols, but bear in mind the guardian drones are 2 points cheaper. Next up in 5 stars is the Strike Team. Strike Teams are like Breacher Teams with a longer range weapon. The choice between Pulse Rifle and Pulse Carbine comes down to whether you want more mobile army or a longer range army. I think most people will agree when they say a 30 inch strength 5 weapon is disgustingly good for a troops choice. The only other thing to mention about Strike Teams and Breacher Teams is they both have the ability to drop a turret down. The turret can equip one of two missile weapons and both are decent weapons but I think you're usually better off with two fire warriors who are actually able to move. If the turret gets out of coherency it just dies. I think it might be playable if you could just leave it, but it couldn't hold any objectives by itself. Next up in 5 stars, here we go, the XV-104 Riptide Battlesuit. The Riptide is just absolutely insane. They are very points intensive, but what you're getting out of it is worth it. They get a good number of shots out of their heavy burst cannons, and smart missile systems will delete most elite infantry and light vehicles. Add into that the advanced targeting system's extra AP, and most things you're shooting at ain't gonna be living too long. So it DAC as well, but can it survive being shot at? Uh, yeah. This is what the Riptide does over so many other vehicles in 40k, it survives. It can get a 3 up invulnerable save at the cost of one mortal wound. This is what we call insanely good value. Add to that the 1 CP stratagem that allows you to use the Nova Reactor again, so you can get 6 extra shots on your heavy burst cannon, and you've got yourself one mean unit. There is a third option in the Nova Reactor that allows you to charge away from enemies, but unless your Riptide is super out of position, or you need to do a fire and fade style movement, I don't see you using this one over the extra shots one. You can take 2 shield and missile drones as well, however they come out at an expensive 40 points each. For a unit with a 5 up ballistic skill, I don't think you want to take these even with their 4 up invulnerable save. If you need to get some extra protection on your Riptides, just take some shield drones to sit next to them. You can make really good use out of the target lock support system that allows your Riptide to move and fire heavy weapons without the penalty. You can also get this bonus if you get 4 mark lights down, so in the correct matchup you might want to favour the velocity tracker instead, especially if you are fighting Eldar, Necrons, other Tau or even Space Marines.
To round off the list, we have Tactical Drones coming in at 5 stars. Tactical Drones are included inside many squads, but they can be taken on their own. They come in 3 different flavours, Gun with 2 Pulse Carbines, Shield with no guns but can take damage better, and Marker Drones who can lay down Marker Lights and don't suffer the penalty for moving and firing them. In terms of best to worst, I'd say Marker, then Shield, and then way 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 down, you have the Gun Drones. Gun Drones have to target the nearest thing, which is okay for getting something close off your back, but it can lead to the case where your opponent is giving your drones nothing good to shoot. At. The shield drones are pretty good for soaking up shots if your drones are being targeted, and good for mitigating wounds when using the saviour protocol ability to take a shot for a battle suit or infantry. I wouldn't recommend taking shots for your regular fire warriors, as the drones are worth more than a fire warrior, but your expensive battle suits is definitely worth it, especially for a multi damage weapon. This is because the shot will only do one damage to the drone, as the rule says. If the wound wall is successful, on a 2 up, your drone suffers one mortal wound and the attack sequence ends. The reason why shield drones are better at taking these shots is because they have a 5 up feel no pain, which means even after you take the mortal wound, you have a 1 in 3 chance of not even losing the drone. Pretty good if you ask me. Finally, we have the marker drone. These guys are the cheapest ways to get a large volume of marker lights fired. Admittedly, you do only have a 1 in 3 chance of getting the marker light down, but bear in mind, for only 10 points, you can spam these guys out, and as long as you get enough marker lights, you should be fine. As for something strange about the drones, they all have leadership 6. They also don't have anything in the rules that stops them from running away, so if enough of your drones die, they can still flee. Why does an autonomous drone, which part of its job is to suicide to save living things, get scared away when drones die? Uh, to fix their crummy leadership, just park an ethereal near enough to them. You can also deep strike these drone units, but I think they're better off on the board from the start, because it allows you to intercept wounds from the very beginning of the game. Alright, that is it for the Tau Codex review, I'd like to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, leave a like and subscribe for more similar content. If you have any thoughts on this list or anything else, feel free to leave a comment, I do read them. Oh, and in other Warhammer news, there's about to be a new edition around the block. I'll try to give a good overview when it comes out and I'll probably do a wishlist my thoughts on the new edition soon, so look forward to that. Also, they decided to release a whole new range of Necron stuff right after my review. My work is never truly done it seems. Anyway, I hope to see you all in the next video.